she was such a great threat that they imprisoned her behind a wall of black holes. Tonight, we're talking about Abeloth. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another fantastic episode of the Empire Radio Podcast. I'm Andrew. I'm Jeremiah. I'm Drew. And we're doing something a little different. We're giving it a shot, giving something, uh, giving a new format a shot. So that's why the episode started a little bit differently. I'm only going to say this once because that would completely defeat the purpose of changing the format if I did this every time. So we're going to try something new. We're going to jump straight into the episode content right now. And uh, we're going to move the social media stuff and the voicemail time, which, by the way, we have seven voicemails, I believe, tonight. Fun. Uh, we have a few people that actually sent in, too. So we're going to try uh, doing that at the end of the episode. We're just going to get right into the content. Uh, and also, this is the first in an unofficial series, because this, this is not an official series yet, but an unofficial series I like to call EU with Andrew. <laughs> okay for, for all of for all of you that are out there that have wanted more eu content i'm hoping that little by little we're going to sprinkle it in there with these episodes i've got a logo you know it, it's a whole deal that i just did today uh spontaneously in preparation for this episode so like i mentioned in the beginning we are talking we're jumping straight into the deep end because this is the, the, the topic for today, Abeloth, is arguably, you could argue pretty heavily for it being the scariest topic in all of Star Wars and the biggest threat to the expanded universe. I would say scary for the Star Wars characters. Uh, you might not be afraid by what we're going to talk about. <laughs> it, you probably won't. But for them, it would be the for sure the scariest and the biggest threat. Uh, so I got a presentation for Ooh. all of you that are watching the Twitch stream. I'm going to share my screen. Or YouTube. Or YouTube, correct. And then we're going to get going. So for all of you that are wanting more EU stuff, get pumped. Because it is finally happening. What about those who don't? Uh, well, are, you know. Are they supposed to get pumped too, I guess? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, I'm, it's, I'm, it's, it's happening. I'm, I'm pumped, I guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to dive right in. Oh, I like you your would... little thing in the corner there. On your Definitely not trash. Yeah, there's a little, there's a little, a little sentence in the top right hand corner that says definitely not trash. Okay, uh, you with Andrew, this is the unofficial first episode of this little unofficial micro series. Uh, first thing we need to do, boys, I need to do for you is I need to take you through a brief overview of the expanded universe, which in and of itself, a brief overview could be its own episode. Um, but this is just the stuff that really matters to this story directly. Okay. So for those of you listening, watching, there's going to be like 90 85 to 90 percent of the eu that i'm going to leave out like there's a lot of details that i'm not going to go into but i'm trying to give jeremiah and drew a snapshot of what was going on and some of the events as they pertain to this story because you'll find out very quickly that abeloth has a story that is very deeply embedded in a like a large portion of the star wars timeline uh, it's not just it wasn't just like a one time thing where she made an appearance. It was like there there was thing there were things happening throughout the whole thing. So uh, let's dive in. So first and foremost, nine ABY 
Thrawn trilogy happens, which we talked about in a previous episode. If you missed that, we went over the graphic novel adaptations of the original Thrawn trilogy. Go check those out. Uh, but 9 ABY, Thrawn trilogy happens, the events of those. And Jason and Jaina Solo are born to Han and Leia. I think you guys remember that. Because, like, definitely. A little bit. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremiah. <laughs> All right. So, 22 ABY. 13 years later, Jaina and Jason uh, join Luke's Praxium, Jedi Praxium, on Yavin 4. Ooh, ooh. Uh, about three years later, the Yuuzhan Vong invade the galaxy, and the Jedi younglings are moved to a station called the Shelter in the Maw. Uh, this is a pretty important detail. So when the Yuuzhan Vong invaded, uh, Yuuzhan Vong were a race from outside the galaxy that... Uh, identified the Jedi as the biggest threat. So it wasn't like we got to take down the Republic military or any of the like defense fleets. It's like, no, we need to go straight to the Jedi and take them out because they're going to be our biggest threat. So they had a ton of specialty things, weapons, abilities that were directly related to killing Jedi. That's basically all you need to know for this. We can do a full episode on the Yuuzhan Vong at a later date. But basically, it was a huge threat. And when they, they came in and attacked, they attacked Yavin 4, and as a result, uh, Luke was like, yo, we need to get the younglings out of here. And the shelter was a station inside the mall, uh, which for those of you that don't know, it's a cluster of black holes. It is also uh, part of what people have to travel through in the Kessel Run. Um, it's over there in hut space, kind of over in the outer rim on the eastern side of the galaxy. Um, and they brought the younglings to this facility, which was owned by Lando Calrissian, to hide them essentially from the invasion because as you'll find out pretty quickly that Yuuzhan Vong uh, war lasted a very long time a few years uh, in 27 ABY Yuuzhan Vong capture Coruscant Jason Solo is imprisoned by the Yuuzhan Vong um, and while he's imprisoned he encounters uh, Vergier I'm going to say Vergier I don't know how you pronounce it but uh, Vergier is important because it was a Jedi. Uh, they were a Jedi turned Sith, and it was Jason Solo's first experiences with some of the teachings of the dark side. Fun. Any qu Drew? <laughs> the chat is going crazy. <laughs> uh, everyone's like, oh, Jeremiah, he's not actually paying attention. He's watching Stranger Things in a different window. And then you have... Uh, it's just, no, uh, no, I'm just I'm just distracted by the typo. <laughs> the, the third one. That's fine. And then, <laughs> I, and, and then I noticed that the plant you have there is actually like the Horn of Africa. Like showing in there. So it's like... Okay, all right. Guys. <laughs> next, next slide. Yeah, we're, we're moving. We're moving. Uh, okay. 28 ABY. Jason Solo escapes captivity. Ooh. So it's like a year later. So he's in captivity for a good while. Uh, 29 ABY, Coruscant is liberated from the Yuuzhan Vong, and Jason B Solo begins his search of the Force. So, so who uh, liberates Coruscant? Uh, the Jedi and the Republic. And how the, big the, is the Jedi at this point? Like, are um, they like 30 people? Or they it doesn't hundreds, actually or? matter technically for this story, but I mean, Luke Luke had a praxy. I mean, he was working on a temple. I'd guess there's a, I would guess there's a small handful of them, maybe a few hundred. Okay. Um, he, he hasn't had time to build it up to the, the, the numbers that it once was, but it's not like, I would say it's more than just like 10 people. All right. Um, so this search of the force jason goes on some travels throughout the galaxy he separates himself uh he kind of leaves the the jedi temple behind for a while and he, it's basically like a soul searching trip um where he encounters different aspects of the dark side uh 30 aby the new jedi academy a new jedi academy is constructed on Ossus. the one sith are founded on korriban uh one thing you need to know about the one sith is that they are not of the Bane line, so they're not of the Rule of Two um, line, and they're not of any really any other line that we've seen in thousands of years. They believe uh, that there should be one all-powerful Sith ruler that rules over all the other Sith exclusively. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So about five years later, the Killicks appear, 
and they're an insectoid species that have a hive mind. Um, and they all have like, it's really interesting. They have like a collective memory and uh, somewhat of a collective conscience. Um, and they have a really good memory, but the one downside of the memory, even though it dates back like thousands of years, they, they have a hard time uh, distinguishing fact from myth, which is a pretty big flaw in your memory. Um, that's just a side note, uh, but they appear in the galaxy, the dark neck nest tri crisis and the swarm wars occur. So all you need to know about that is there is, uh, the, the Kilix were an enemy of the Republic and of the Chiss at the time. And it was kind of a three sided war, uh, that was happening in the galaxy, but some Jedi were taken and made to be a part of the hive mind during that battle or during the war. All right. 40 ABY, Jason Solo far, falls to the dark side under Lumaya, uh, Lady Lumaya, and kills Mara Jade. <gasps> uh, yep. The Second Galactic Civil War wait, breaks wait, out. Wait, is that his mom? Uh, it's his aunt. Oh. Uh, Jason is, is Han's oh, child. Oh, freaking. Yeah. So, yeah. So at this point, Mara is married to Luke? Correct. Correct. Okay. So Mara is married to Luke. They actually have a kid at this point named Ben Skywalker. Um, and she is killed by Jason. Uh, the second major galactic civil war breaks out. Uh, during that war, Lumaya is killed by Luke. And shortly after that, Jason officially becomes Darth Cadus. He becomes a Sith Lord. Uh, so... All of this to say, what is happening is Han and Leia's kid, I guess roughly, in a roughly similar fashion, falls to the dark side, becomes a Sith Lord. Uh, Luke loses his wife. And now there's a second galactic civil war going on. Um, have you guys ever seen pictures of uh, the... There's a, It's a woman, and she's like half in an Imperial outfit. She's got like uh, a head wrap and a face wrap on, and she has a light whip. I've seen pictures of a light whip, so I'm assuming that was her. Yeah, but that I was don't Lumaya. remember her. Yeah. Okay, and it's this is the side note. It's kind of interesting that uh, Leia and Han's kid turns to the dark side, just like Kylo Ren. So yeah. I didn't realize that they kind of followed that same. There, type of thing. there are more similarities than you might expect. Which except makes there wasn't twins. And Luke doesn't have a kid. But then they take Luke's kid's name and put it on their kid's name. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Jaina Solo never, she never turns to the dark side. Uh, she continues being a Jedi. Um, but Jason definitely does. He becomes Darth Cadus. Um, and during this Civil War, this is something that is very much, it's pretty crucial to the story. Center Point Station, which I'll explain later, is destroyed during the Second Civil War. 41 ABY, a year later, Darth Cadus takes Tahiri Vela as an apprentice. Um, and then, during that same year, he is killed by Jaina, his sister. So, he's no longer a Sith Lord because he is no longer alive. Oh, so uh, she killed Jason. Her brother. Correct. Okay, not the Tahiri. You're correct. Okay. Correct. So he did take an apprentice, but she, you know, she was like, I've got to put a stop to this. And then, of course, there's like a big, like, Skywalker family kind of thing that happens, and she kills him. She has to, she has to kill him. Um, 43 ABY. So two, year late, two years later, Luke is exiled from the Order. Uh, he and his son. Ben uh, Skywalker encountered the Mind Walkers of St. Cole Station. This is really important uh, because of what Luke and his son learn from that experience. Uh, but Luke is exiled because uh, of some tensions between himself and the the new or the new government organization um, and the Jedi Order, and so he's exiled. <laughs> he's no longer Grand Master of the Jedi Order anymore which is a bummer. Um, and then 44 ABY, Avaloth begins doing things and Ish hits the fan. <laughs> okay. Yep. So that's that's kind of a, it's like 40, uh, 
44 years worth of Star Wars expanding universe history after the Battle of Yavin in like five or 10 minutes. Uh, so part two, we're going to talk about Abelos history. So we're going to start from the very beginning and we're going to work our way forward into what we now know is the period after the Battle of Yavin. Any questions so far? No. Cool. Nope. I'm going to take a sip. All right, we're ready, and, Mr. Andrew. Uh, I, Professor. I don't know why. Um, That's what. The... <laughs> okay, so are they, I'm sorry, are yeah. they, is the chat, the Twitch chat right now tr treating me like a teacher? Is they all happening? think they're in school, and oh. you are Mr. Andrew, and people oh. are saying, oh, Mr. Andrew, I threw up. Mr. Oh. Andrew, can I go get a drink? And so on and so forth. Hey, and... no, this is this is a college class. Look. You can do what you want. If you show up for class, that's on you. Yeah, if you show up for class, it's on you. Just you, you, if you no. need to go to the bathroom, just go. I don't care. You know, <laughs> unless it's Drew, he needs to stay here and be a part of the podcast. Um, Why only me? <laughs> I know the answer to that. Yeah, Jeremiah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Jeremiah. For those of you that aren't watching the video stream right now, Jeremiah got up and acted like he was leaving. All right. Let's talk about Abelos history. So there's an interesting, uh, as you might notice from the picture that I have here, of the mural of the father, the son, and the daughter from Rebels um, that I have on my screen. There's some interesting um, kind of tie-ins to canon that I don't think were there originally before the Clone Wars uh, to the same extent, but now they are. Uh, so you'll you'll see that happen in just a second. So... Uh, this takes place approximately 100,000 years before the Battle of Yavin. So we're talking long time ago, in like really long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So three celestial beings take on human form and settle on a tropical world near what is now known as Hut Space over in the Outer Rim. After a period of time, the son and daughter, as they are known, defy their father the son drinks from the, fa the font of power while the daughter bathes in the pool of wisdom as a result they take on uh the light and dark sides of the force and enter an, an internal conflict with one another only to be brought into balance again by the father each time so uh interestingly enough the son and daughter that we see in clone wars is actually they're actually not aligned with the sides different sides of the force in the beginning uh, until they drink and bathe, respectively, and then they adopt those aspects of the Force as uh, a result. So this is an eternal Force being doing this. This is a very important distinction. These are two eternal Force beings doing this, it, coming in contact directly with very powerful Force nexus, nex, nexuses, nexus, nexi, nexu. Nexi? I don't know. There are nex. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, so there are two, these really powerful force next nexuses <laughs> you're about to say it. <laughs> yeah and that and and that's uh that's very worth noting and kind of holding on to in the back of your mind that these are two eternal force beings that are doing this not humans uh so moving on after a time a human woman found their planet and joined them she joined the one's family as the mother being a supportive wife to the father and helping to channel the son and daughter's energy into constructive things rather than destructive ones. So beforehand, the son and the daughter were always in conflict and that leaked out into the galaxy and caused destruction. The father would rein them back in. Now the mother comes in and she begins to pretty much say, hey, what if you like healed things instead of destroying them, doing stuff like that um, and using your powers for good rather than evil? So it works for a time. Uh, and there is peace. Uh, being mortal, however, she aged and lost the ability to keep the peace. So she inevitably gets old. She loses the ability to rein them in the same way. Uh, and then she becomes deeply, deeply afraid of losing her family to death, which is understandable. Uh, as a result of that fear, she disobeyed the father by both drinking from the font of power and bathing in the pool of wisdom. So she said, I'm going, we're doing BOGO. And as a human, I'm not just going to do one. I'm going to do both. 
And because she was mortal, the effects of drinking of uh, drinking from the font and bathing in the pool had terrible side effects. The mother was reborn as an immortal being, extremely f- uh, strong in the force, but with a disgustingly warped body and mind. She emerged a selfish, dark side monster obsessed with forcing her will on others in an attempt of love. I, I, w- I should say a misguided attempt at love. Afraid of her wrath, the father took the children and abandoned her on the planet, fulfilling her darkest fear. Going further into madness and despair, the mother became Abeloth. Um, so Abeloth, re- quick description, is viewed as a very, very pale humanoid female uh, with like almost platinum blonde hair. Her eyes are completely dark. And it's said that they sparkle kind of like there might be miniature galaxies inside of them, but they're completely Mm -hmm. black. She has a fanged mouth that goes from one ear to the other. So it's super, super creepy. Uh, And she's very, very pale. She's very skinny. Uh, It was said that her skin looked like it was stretched too thin. And then to cap all of it off, her limbs are kind of stubby and they end in tentacles. (laughs) Fun. Yeah, so it's kind of kind of kind of nightmare fuel at this mm-hmm. point, no matter which way you look at it. Um okay, so Ish hits the fan. They're like, oh, this is not good. So in an attempt to stop her from wreaking havoc on the galaxy, the son and daughter uh returned to their home world and turned the entire region into what we now know as the Mall, a cluster of black holes. They so, enlisted uh- Sorry. How is she how would she be able to wreak havoc on the galaxy if she's stuck on a planet? Um because it was only a matter of time before she got away. So very oh, quickly okay. this, is, this is this is very early in her powers. You're gonna find out later that she has the powers to teleport and like expand her mind and influence people subtly and all these things. Like it, it's it's a huge threat and the son and the daughter were like, before this gets any worse, we've got to, we've got to do something right now. Okay. Um, so the mall that we know in Star Wars canon now in the expanded universe was created by the son and the daughter as a means to contain her to that specific place. They enlisted the Killick species, which I, I mentioned earlier, the insectoid species, uh, an insectoid hive mind collective from Alderaan. That's right. They're originally from Alderaan to help them in the project. And stations like Centerpoint and Sinkhole stations were created to hold the mall together. Hmm, like uh, Centerpoint space energy. energy. So <laughs> this is all still going on in 100,000 years? Correct. This is, this is oh, yeah, okay. yeah, very far back in the past. Uh, the, 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 the timeline for this is all based on approximation but it's still even if a few years passed it still would have been you know a really long time back um so they create these stations that are supposed to help keep the mall together and make sure that she is contained Uh, it is worth noting that for whatever reason because they use black holes her influence and her powers cannot actually reach beyond that area as well so she's completely contained at this point she can't break out now, we are going to jump <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of years into the future and talk about her influence on the current time in Star Wars. Uh, but before we do, any questions? No. No. No? I was hoping you guys were going to have more. We're going through this much quicker than I thought we would. I thought you guys would be like <clears throat> asking stuff left and right, but... No. We we have nothing to base questions off of because we don't know anything about the EU. So yeah, it's like... <laughs> the the question in chat is: Is it the same mall in Solo? So the mall in Solo is the octopus thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So not related. Uh, that octopus thing is not related. Yeah. Um, I if if it was the same mall and they encountered her, we would have known it. We would have we would have definitely known it. Um, I don't think I do not think that she has been brought into canon yet. 
Uh, if she has, they've done it incredibly subtly, and they're doing some like MCU level storytelling and setup. That would be cool. That would be really cool. Um, and then um, David said, "Wait, Darth Maul in Solo?" Uh, no, not this, not Maul. Maul <laughs> with a dumb <laughs> uh, uh, Thank you. <laughs> Daddy Palps. No, this is Patrick. That's funny. So yeah. that okay, this is gonna, okay. If you're not, if you're only listening, you're not gonna see this. But the image that you have on there of that yes white thing, yep. it reminds me of in the Legend of Korra when they go back to the yep. first Avatar. Yep. That I can't remember the, the good and evil or something like mm-hmm. yeah it had these like weird abstract yeah blobs and that looked, uh, reminds me of that. She her she can take a lot of different forms. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but so. The, first of all, there's barely any fan art or any artist rendering of Avaloth out there. They're like four or five main pictures, and if you've seen them, you know you've seen them. Like they're they're pretty spooky. Um, and that image that you have on the screen is not spooky. <laughs> no, it was it was more from I just needed some diversity. Uh, but yeah, so there's not a ton of information about her. Um, a lot of this is pretty heavily coming from uh, the Fate of the Jedi novels. But I did a lot of research on YouTube as well. Said no one ever in academic spaces. And step uh, at Star of... Wars school. At Star yeah, Wars Star school. Wars, except for at Star Wars school. Um, so there are a lot of really good, like comprehensive, like 10 minute comprehensive videos on her as well that pretty much cover all that I'm doing, but shorter in a shorter amount of time. Uh, we do have a question in the chat from Riley who asks, uh, so is she good or evil or in between? She is very much evil. So that's a, that's a very good question. So think about her as someone who in an attempt to try to hold on to what she loved, not all that different from Anakin, did something really crazy in drinking from the fountain and bathing in the pool. And then her mind and her body were just basically warped and twisted beyond repair. So the key point here is she, she basically went crazy and then immediately after that lost her family because they were afraid of her and they were like, this is not good. And then she went complete dark side. Uh, so she's extremely powerful in the Force. She has a, a very, very strong, I would argue, one of the strongest connections to the Force in all of the EU. Um, so what, what is her midi-chlorian count? <laughs> <laughs> more, than, more than Anakin? Yeah, Jeremiah is. Okay. That's, that's good. Okay. I don't think it really matters when you become an immortal Force being. But, you know, it's it's pretty high. It's pretty high up there. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, it was very low when she was a human because she wasn't force sensitive at all. Right. Mm. Uh, so yeah. Uh, David in the chat, she basically embodies chaos and madness. That is correct. Uh, so yeah. And someone else mentioned in our Twitch stream chat, uh, that it stated that Avaloth is a dozen times more powerful than Luke. And this is Grandmaster Luke. They are correct. Uh, I believe he is actually the person that says she's about a dozen more times powerful than me. So she's she's pretty she's pretty powerful. All right. So one key point is that because of how powerful her link to the Force was, Abeloth could break free from her prison if an event took place that altered current time or the future in a significant way. This meant that every time she broke free the son and daughter would put aside their differences and capture her again. So over the course of, you know, a hundred thousand odd years, there were a few different times that she actually did break free and began to wreak havoc on the galaxy. Then the son and the daughter had to come together and imprison her again. So now we fast forward to Anakin and the death of the ones. Uh, So, obviously, we know that when Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka visited the Ones during the Clone Wars, they helped cause the events that led to the death of the father, son, and daughter. No no longer would Abelos' captors be able to help. Ooh, that makes sense. So, there's a lot of memes that I've seen where 
people have been like, you know, the father could have been like on his in his dying breath, like, hey, uh, there's a there's a thing in the in a black hole that could literally destroy the entire universe if you don't stop her. She just a heads up, you know, but <laughs> he didn't because this isn't canon, obviously. But I just think it's funny that they went there, and of course, Anakin had a part in all of their deaths. <laughs> Leave it to Anakin. Little uh, Annie. So at this point, if we kind of merge the two timelines of canon and the expanded universe, they th either way, in the expanded universe, it's not really stated, but this way, either way, they're dead. The son and the daughter are dead, okay. and there is no longer the defense mechanism that has previously worked in the past to capture Abeloth again. Over, for over 5,000 years, the galaxy had seen war. Uh, this is the 5,000 years leading up to the Galactic Civil War era. Uh, for the 5,000, over 5,000 years, the galaxy had seen war, whether between the Jedi and the Sith, the Republic and the Confederacy, or the Empire and the Rebellion. These events, along with the deaths of the Ones, compounded and allowed Abeloth to get closer and closer to breaking free once again. So if you think about all of those years of strife and fighting and turmoil, it's basically fueling this large shift in the course of the, the future of the universe to be able to break her out again. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to fast forward to Jason Solo, which is why he was mentioned a lot in the timeline at the beginning. So at one point, uh, Jason Solo, while he's traveling, visits the mall and learns to enter the Beyond Shadows a world between worlds where the force users can tap into the past and future to see visions. Um, so think about this kind of like the, the world between worlds and rebels. Um, it, it's, it's a very, very similar concept, um, but it is, it's directly in a similar way, directly linked to time. Uh, and when force users figure out a way to enter that world at will, they're tapping into the force and they can actually see like they can trigger specific visions of the past and the future at will. Uh, so very, very, very similar concept. While he's there, he sees a vision of a terrible uh, dark man sitting on the throne of balance with his daughter, Alana, at his side. So Jason Solo does have a daughter named Alana, and he sees a vision of this dark man, this evil entity on the throne of balance ruling uh, with his daughter at his side. Horrified, he eventually succumbs to the dark side in an effort to prevent the vision from taking place. Very similar to Anakin. He becomes an apprentice of the Dark Lady Lumaya, which we talked about previously, and later becomes Darth Cadus. He commits terrible acts as Darth Cadus during the Second Galactic Civil War. Right before dying from injuries from his sister, Jaina, Darth Cadus sees a vision of his daughter, Alana, sitting on the throne of balance as a benevolent Jedi queen. Despite what it costs, he was able to prevent the terrible future he saw from take pla taking place. Unfortunately, the Second Galactic Civil War was the final straw. On top of altering time, the conflict saw to the destruction of Centerpoint Station, which I previously mentioned. Slowly... Her prison began to break down, allowing Abeloth to influence uh, her, allowing her influence to spread, and for her to draw Force users in to feed on their power. Ooh. Yeah. So this is where this is forty-four BBY. This is where starts things start hitting the fan. So Centerpoint Station and uh, Sinkhole Station, if you remember, were two stations that were created to help hold the mall together. Um, so when center point station is destroyed, it creates a crack in that prison for her. Uh, it doesn't fall apart right away, but over time it does begin to weaken and weaken and weaken. Uh, and as it weakens, uh, one of Avalos most terrifying abilities is her to be a beacon for force users. Um, it's kind of like an angler fish. <laughs> this is a really weird uh, comparison, but you know, like an angler fish has a little light, and the fish swim up to it thinking it's food, and then you yep. just chomps them. It's the same thing. She draws forced users in with her abilities, with uh, the mystery around her, and you know, sending weird sensations and stuff through the forest. And then she actually feeds on their force energy once they're 
their force energy is fed upon, she can actually in completely possess their bodies and act. Uh, an extension of her can act through those people. So already pretty dangerous stuff is happening. But she begins to influence things throughout the galaxy. Uh, now, being able uh, to influence force users from around the galaxy, Abeloth creates great tension between the Jedi Order and the newly named Galactic Federation of Free Alliances. This came to a head when an entire group of Jedi succumbed to a, fair, a terrifying force psychosis, which we're going to talk about in detail. Uh, and this, and the way it was handled, was eventually the, the, the thing that kind of broke uh, the relationship between the Jedi Order and uh, the galaxy, and that was part of the reason why Luke was exiled. So we're beginning to see that over, things are subtly beginning to happen because of her. But it's still very much behind the scenes. She's working from the shadows. She's not free yet, you know. But things are beginning to, to get really bad, um, and it's very difficult to trace back to her. Seeking for, uh, to further her influence, Abeloth uh, came into contact with an intelligent Sith meditation sphere. This put her into contact with the lost tribe of the Sith who were stranded uh, on the planet Kesh in 5000 BBY. They were visited by the sphere in 41 ABY and learned that the Sith were gone. Uh, enraged and seeing their opportunity, they planned to leave the planet and reclaim the galaxy. Um, so this is interesting because um, the there is a collected, like a collected group of stories from the EU called the Lost Tribe of the Sith. And I actually didn't know that they were related, but I just read that. And then this popped up, and I was like, that make, actually makes a lot of sense. Because there's a group of Sith in service to Naga Sadao, one of the old Sith Lords. They get stranded on this planet, literally with no way to contact the rest of the galaxy. Their ship is presumed lost. And for thousands of years, they live on this planet. And just there's this tribe of Sith, like thousands of Sith, just sitting there. Like, they have an idea of... So this isn't like them like reproducing and having offspring and it's these are the ancestors or are these are the same people that no, got these lost these are the ancestors okay like they 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 form a whole civilization they have children they i mean like so generations they, upon generations were so they're more like like sith like like we see in the rise of skywalker the sith what are they called the Sith Eternal, or the the people in the yeah, robes. where they're they're not Sith, but they're just kind of like no, no, followers no, of the Sith. No, 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 they're Sith. So they're all oh wow, yeah, Force users. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, yeah. In the book, in that book that I read, like it, it's actually kind of like kind of crazy. I have to re I have to remind myself at multiple points that like. We're no, I'm no longer in a world, at least in this story, that there's just two or a few, you know, Sith, like a handful. Like, it was everyone. Like, they all had lightsabers. They, I mean, sure, they were different power levels, but, like, they all had Force abilities. They all were warriors. Like, yeah, it's pretty crazy. So she comes in contact with this lost tribe of the Sith, and they learn that the Sith have been eradicated, and they're like, okay, we, we need to get off this planet. So then all of a sudden, Abeloth hijacks the whole thing. So Abeloth used her influence to steal the Lost Tribe's armada and influence many of the members to become her own personal dark side army. Luke's le Luke learns uh, to enter Beyond Shadow. Uh, so remember I mentioned that he and Ben Skywalker uh, go to the Mind Walkers and they meet the Mind Walkers earlier in the timeline? While they're there, they learn how to enter beyond shadows uh, themselves. They learn how to enter that realm. Uh, while they're doing this, he sees the threat of Abeloth because, and this is very important, she lives and exists on two planes of existence. So she has a physical form and exists in the physical realm, but part of her conscious also lives in the beyond shadows. Fun. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So he's in there and he's like, what the heck is this? He realizes it's a threat. 
uh, and he vows to hunt down her and the Sith. In 44 ABY, Abeloth gains control uh, over Rakari Kim, a newly appointed senator, and gets her elected uh, chief of state. Her lost Sith army is allowed to gain control over Coruscant. Uh, it didn't last long, but you know the Jedi liberate Coruscant. So it's kind of crazy that she manipulates this senator into becoming chief of state and then uses her lost tribe of the Sith to take Coruscant, essentially. They take it back, but it's it, it's crazy. It's crazy that, I mean, they basically were just able to walk in because Abeloth took control over someone and got them to the pinnacle of the government, which is, I guess is similar to Palpatine, mm-hmm. but also kind of different because someone is doing it from a distance rather than being there. She's controlling everything. Uh, Luke learns that Abeloth upon being defeated uh, at Coruscant, has fled once again. This time, uh, she took a Sith apprentice named Vestara Kahi, or Kai, excuse me, to represent the dark side, and his son, Ben Skywalker, to represent the light side. Her goal is to start a new family of her own. So she wants to start a new <laughs> immortal force family, essentially. So she steals Luke's son, which is a big no-no, and one of the Lost Tribe of the Sith, uh, to act as the son and the daughter. The two resisted, forcing Abeloth into a battle in the physical realm. Meanwhile, Luke enters the Beyond Shadows along with Jason Solo's Force Ghost to confront Abeloth there. Uh, so it's kind of a two-pronged attack. He actually would have been defeated, but he was joined by a completely unrelated Sith Lord, who we end up finding out is the Dark Man in Jason's vision, named Darth Krait. Krait knew that it would take Masters of the Light and the Dark to defeat Abeloth, and her spirit was defeated. Now, this is important because you remember I mentioned the one Sith Empire. And this is Darth Krait, the ruler of that empire that was building over time on Korriban this whole time. So he risked revealing himself and his empire to the greater Star Wars galaxy because she was so much of a threat. So he entered the realm with Luke and Cadus's Force Ghost, and they defeated Avalos Spirit there, and then her physical form was defeated as well. Aftermath. So, unwilling to accept that Avaloth was truly defeated, Luke took it upon himself to find the Mortis Dagger, the only way to defeat a being like the Ones. His quest was to find the dagger and keep it at the ready should Avaloth ever return. Unfortunately, though, this story was never brought into EU canon. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, The Fate of the Jedi is like one of the last big publishing uh, pushes that they did in the expanded universe before things were halted. Um, so there was set up for another story, but it just never happened. Hmm. So you're probably thinking, okay, well, this this is, you know, crazy and kind of weird, but why is, why is Abeloth a threat? Well, we're going to talk about her... Uh, yeah, I just looked down at the chat. Daddy Palp says, crate like sand people crate? That's cool. Yes, Darth Crate spelled the same way, uh, like a crate dragon. He took the name Darth Crate, which is super cool. Uh, and there's actually a story uh, where the Republic has to do with his simp- Sith Empire too, but it's for another episode. Uh, so Abelos' powers and abilities. First of all, she's immortal. She has an immensely powerful connection to the Force. Like I mentioned, one of the most powerful in all of the EU, if not the most powerful. I, I would, I guess the father, the son, and the daughter might have been more powerful, but she was up there. Uh, she could possess multiple people at once. She had large-scale mind control abilities. She could project avatars and illusion illusions across great distances. Uh, She had powerful, super, super powerful dark side energy blast. Uh, And physically speaking, uh, she used her tentacles super effectively and, like, just destroyed people uh, in physical combat as well. Whipping them. Yeah. Uh, She consumed force energy. She could teleport when she was threatened. Uh, And she lived in two realms, the physical realm as well as beyond shadows, which meant that killing her in one did not mean fully killing her. You had to kill her in both to at the same fully time get rid of correct to, mm-hmm. to fully get rid of her. Um so 
she is the most powerful dark side force user in the expanding universe by a long shot. Dang. Like the ability to possess multiple people, to mind control multiple people, all from all the while from inside the mall. Um like it it's mind blowing. Like she was super powerful on a battlefield and she could wreck people. But then she also, over the course of many, many years, orchestrated things from the shadows. She was very smart and she orchestrated things from the shadows in the similar way that Palpatine did but I would say on a larger scale because she had more direct reach into people's minds. Uh, so next, uh, we're going to talk about force psychosis and why this, this is just one example of her powers, but why this is a really good example as to why she was such a threat to the galaxy. But first, you know, what's not a threat to the galaxy I don't. Tell me about it. Wesley Andrews Coffee and Tea, the sponsor of today's episode. And it just so happens that I have a word from them right now that you should listen to. So check it out. Hey, everyone. Andrew here. I'm pleased to tell you that the sponsor for today's episode is Wesley Andrews Coffee and Tea. If you don't know anything about Wesley Andrews, you definitely should. They're an award-winning coffee roaster and shop in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they make fantastic coffee. The awesome thing is that they have a subscription service that gets those amazing coffee beans delivered to your door on an either weekly, bi-weekly, uh. or monthly basis. Unfortunately, we're all being negatively affected by this virus right now. But that being said, what a better time to try some new coffee and support a local business. I know they'll greatly appreciate it, and we will too. After all, using the code Empire Radio with a capital E and a capital R with no space at checkout, when you start a new subscription at WesleyAndrews.cc, you'll get 50% off your first purchase. I can't think of a better deal. Get 50% off, support a local Minneapolis coffee shop, and support your favorite Star Wars podcast. In the words of Emperor Palpatine, do it. You know what to do. Do it. Go get a coffee subscription, wesleyandrews.cc. You won't regret it. I nope. promise. Mm-hmm. It's going to be great stuff. All right. So let's. this is the final section uh, of this discussion on Avaloth. But this is – the whole purpose of this is to give you a glimpse of the, dev- the subtle devastation that she could cause in the galaxy. And this is before she even got out of the black hole, the mall. Uh, While the Jedi younglings, including a young Ben Skywalker, were at the shelter during the Yuuzhan Vong War. So you remember I mentioned that earlier. uh, Which was in the mall, Abeloth peppered them with the force and feelings of extreme loneliness from her her prison inside the mall. So remember, uh, the whole basis of her transformation was loneliness and wanting to have a family and and being afraid of losing her family so she uh, oftentimes force users would describe her as this overwhelming kind of gnawing sense of just utter despair and long longing and loneliness uh kind of creeping in uh you know kind of out of the fringes um and then many force users have described them sensing like they're being watched through the force by an extremely dark being uh, the effects of the contact with the younglings with Abeloth were not immediate, however, and didn't really manifest themselves until years later, around 43 ABY. Uh, so we're talking a few years later. So the first to show symptoms was Valen Horn, Corin's, Corin Horn's son. Uh, it's a pretty famous Jedi in the EU. While visiting his parents, Valen was overcome by an immensely powerful feeling that his parents were imposters who had been replaced, uh, who had replaced the real ones. He violently attacked them before fleeing, uh, and the same symptoms, symptoms were later shown in his sister and every other Jedi who stayed in the mall. So there was an entire generation of younglings that a few years later had psychotic breaks. And 
they they weren't simultaneous. They happened over the course of time, but the, the as time progressed, these breaks began to be more frequent. And they all believed in this conspiracy. Um, excuse me. The symptoms were manifested suddenly, without warning, and led the Jedi to believe the same conspiracy. Uh, that basically every everyone around them, especially their loved ones, have been replaced uh, with imposters by a dark and powerful entity. Sometimes the Jedi would hide from everyone, but in many cases they react with extreme violence while trying to destroy the fakes and find their real relatives. Uh, as a side effect, they also manifested force abilities that were rare and or beyond their current skill levels. Uh, the only way to stop them was through the force. Um... There was time in between individual breaks, but the progression did become quicker. Um, so it's interesting. One of the one of the rare force abilities, for example, uh, one of the one of the victims was taken, and they were trying to to look at his brain, and he had the ability in the force to completely shield his brain from medical equipment. Like they couldn't get a reading at all. So it's like really weird stuff, uh, really rare abilities that were for their age and for their skill level, normally far beyond them. So it's crazy because out of nowhere, suddenly they would believe that they would become paranoid and they would believe that everyone's been replaced. And then that would be coupled with a sense of longing and a sense to find their real family who would be manifested later as Abeloth. Uh, she would be drawing them in. But then they would react violently because of the paranoia to their surroundings. So they, they were attacking people. Like we, you have young They're Jedi, like psychotic at a certain yeah. point. Yeah, Dang. I mean, like you have young Jedi, young Force wielders attacking people in their surroundings because they they genuinely believe that they're being replaced. So Anakin was right all along about killing the younglings. She just kept. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, no treatment for this psychosis was 100% successful. However, the method that did show the best success was cutting the Force user off from the Force, and it only lessened their aggression. It was not until Abeloth was finally, quote, killed, because there's kind of a hint that she wasn't fully killed, but whatever, uh, that the symptoms finally subsided in the Jedi. Mm. So Wow. Yeah, so that that's a small glimpse it's very hard to kind of understand the threat of abeloth from like from a thirty thousand point or foot view because so much of it was on the person to person like psychological level where she would manipulate people through the force she would draw them in and then like completely feed off of them and then replace them with herself and manipulate things that way but then on top of all that it's like she had it's the perfect combination of like the most powerful, most dangerous dark side force user with the manipulation and long game playing skills of Palpatine, but mm -hmm. even better. So it's like the perfect combination of like subtlety and espionage and, you know, kind of manipulating things from the inside, but then also just sheer power. Like she could go into a battlefield and just destroy people left and right very easily. Um, not only that, she looked really horrific. <laughs> like yeah. her whole appearance is like nightmare fuel. Yeah. Um, so, so question. It sucks. Yes. Um, how many books does this, is she covered like all this timeline? Like how many, is it like three books? Is it a trilogy of stories or is it like no, 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 no. 20 the books? Of the, or the fate what? of the Jedi series was longer. I actually don't, I can look at it right now. So, She's only in the Fate of the Jedi series? Or, like, what's the... So, that that's the... There are nine books in that. Um, that's kind of the weird thing, is because if you look at it as a larger story, there are things before the Fate of the Jedi series, like the Second Galactic Civil War, the destruction of Centerpoint Station, like you know the stuff the influence that she had on the you know the jedi padawans that like aren't it, it, no one comes out and says this is abeloth you know this is related 
But like, if you look back, there are things in multiple different books outside of the Fate of the Jedi series that you're like, oh, that so was a that so was a direct thing. So the main stories yeah. about her are kind of like saying, in the fa- in the hey, fate remember this that happened in this other book? Correct. It was actually her all along. Like, yeah, dang, yeah, get that all along. It's kind of the it's kind of the the same vibe as like reading Plagueis and realizing how much of that in the expanded universe was orchestrated by Plagueis and Palpatine. Mm-hmm. You know, but like, it's so much worse, and it's and it's crazy because it really her story encompasses more, in my opinion, of the Star Wars story as a whole than any other character we have, because she she predates everything. She goes all the way back to the the ones, the father, the son, and the daughter. So we've got a tie-in at the very beginning of the Star Wars Galaxy. We have a, a little bit of something in the Clone Wars, kind of. And then all the way after, you know, hundreds of thousands of years later, in at, after the Battle of Yavin, after Return of the Jedi. And she's been there in the mall the whole time. She's broken out a few times, but then we finally everything finally comes to a head because the son and the daughter aren't alive to stop her. And then all of a sudden, Luke's got to do it. Luke's got to do it, you know. So, so, what is her goal or end game? Is it to, to destroy everything, or what? Well, she's she's the embodiment of chaos and destruction, but she's driven by a desire to to force others, her will on others, to seek affection. Her whole thing is like, I need family. Her whole thing is fear of losing family. Her whole thing is like. Because that's what happened to her right away. Correct. Mm. So that's at the core of it. But that, so she needs a hug. Itself. She just needs a hug. Um. Yeah. Mm-hmm. By those younglings that she took over. Yep. Group hug. Group hug. It, it is interesting, <laughs> by the way, that Ben Sol- Ben Skywalker was on the shelter station for a short time. He actually there's there's a little excerpt that you can go read where he talks about feeling her presence and it's really creepy. But then he cuts himself off from the Force during the Yuuzhan Vong War because, obviously, he's a Skywalker. He's very Force-sensitive. And there was so much death and destruction during the Yuuzhan Vong War happening to the Force. Focus. He cut himself off. Yeah. yeah he, he was too overwhelming. Like, yeah. And so that alone saved him from a psychotic break later. So he was, like, the mm. only one that didn't get affected so it's kind of crazy but then you know like her story involves this completely different world beyond shadows that is you know which is interesting because it's it's very similar to that you know world between worlds from rebels there's a lot of parallels that could could be drawn but i would go on record as saying she was the greatest threat to the galaxy of all of the expanding universe canon Dang. By, by like a long shot like the, she, she 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 dwarfs palpatine as a threat because she right. had the, his manipulative skills his ability his tactical ability but then she could also directly influence like through the force the influence people's minds possess them possess them like lead them to do different things from light years thousands of light years away mm-hmm not only that, she could do all of that while fighting incredibly well. She manipulated the entire Lost Tribe of the Sith, which, by the way, if you ever come across that book, The Collected Stories, it's really good. I would recommend it. Um, but, like, she but she was also simultaneously just, like, an embodiment of pure dark side evil. Like, if there was ever a form a personified form of pure evil in the Star Wars universe, it was her. Like, she was she was seriously bad news. And if it weren't for, you know, them destroying her, Luke destroying her, she could have destroyed so the galaxy. how did he destroy her? Like, like with a lightsaber? lightsaber or what was, like, no, the no, cause no, no. of her death? Like, what was... So it was, a like I mentioned, it was a two-pronged effort. So Ben Skywalker, you remember she stole him and... Uh, the other the sith girl after the battle of coruscant after they got coruscant back Mm -hmm. she stole the two of them to create her own family before she could get them there they resisted and started fighting her in her physical form and then simultaneously luke entered the beyond shadows 
his his spirit, his four spirit entered that realm where the other half of her being lived uh, and existed. And with Cadus' spirit, which I guess he would have been Jason Solo instead of Darth Cadus, but with his spirit, as well as the spirit of Darth Krait, who joined them, it was like they defeated her in the spirit realm, like the, the four spirit realm. And then ben and the sith girl defeated her physical form because it was a two-pronged effort oh because they had they had to do it at the same time or she wouldn't have actually died i don't know it just seems like she's so powerful that like no one could kill her like i don't i don't know it just seems also far-fetched i'm i'm kind of confused on how jason solo is good now he turned i guess he turned back to the light side right after he killed his Aunt, he's just like his. Okay, his, well, he's freaking his, Vader did the same thing. Yeah, he's just like oh his grandpa. Gosh. So I, I don't know. It's just kind of weird that she's so powerful, but now she could be, be killed be, so easily. To, uh, to be fair, it wasn't easily. So you had a super, super powerful, accomplished, like super accomplished Sith. I mean, they had to ben kill Sky- him in both different worlds. Like, it's yeah, not Ben easy. Skywalker himself was super powerful at this point. He's Luke's son. And then you have Jedi Grandmaster Luke. So, at his, the pinnacle of his power, in in a in a for a pure Force form. Uh, Jason Solo's Force form, which was also very po- he was very powerful in his. Well, own I right. could understand the 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 spiritual realm, but like the physical killing, like. I don't know if she's so strong with the force that she could just like teleport, like well, or she's just also, like she's also break fighting their on. Like, I don't she's know. also fighting on two different fronts, though. So she's, because she was split. she's yeah, she's yeah. too spread out. Okay, because that was I mean that was part of her power though. Like nobody knew her weakness until that point, because no one had ever been able to enter the beyond shadows before and realized so, that that was there would she have been able to combine her two forms back into one i don't know okay so but then uh the other thing that i wanted to mention is darth crate as a sith like dark side force user was also extremely powerful so you had this master of the dark side a master of the light side who in expanded universe canon had been to the dark side and back, more powerful. Plus Jason Solo's Force Ghost, plus the two of them fighting her in physical form. Which I think at the, at that point, she may have uh, possessed someone's body, so it might not have been her actual like hmm. scary form. But mm-hmm. that's that's what happens. Plus I mean, Wesley t- Andrews' t- coffee for energy. Yeah. Yeah, Luke actually had a cup of coffee right before he entered the Beyond Shadows. So, it's crazy. I I mean, like, I would recommend reading the books, but... That's a lot of books. Nine. I mean, I know Jeremiah probably won't. If they, if they make a movie, I'll watch the movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, if they make a movie, I'll watch the, I think yeah. everyone... That, it sounds like... I mean, who knows, right? Like... I mean, I, I'm going to give it to you, Andrew. Everything that you told us tonight was hands down better than The Last Jedi. That's what I'm saying. Everything. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> All, and and I, think, I think it would have been really cool is if they had done, if they had made her the antagonist in the sequel trilogy instead of Palpatine again. Or Snoke. Or make anyone a, an fair. antagonist. <laughs> Snoke. Or, or, like maybe, or maybe we have Snoke. And like, but he's just possessed by her, and he's just a pawn. And then she, cut, you know, they have to they have to fight. And like, that would have been a cool way to bring Luke and all the other Jedi back because they were fighting in a Force realm too. You know what I'm saying? Instead of just the physical realm. So, all right. Anyways, so our- so that's 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 Abeloth in a nutshell. All right. Uh, all right. The, the biggest threat to the expanded universe galaxy. Well, you guys it's, heard it's kind of funny first. Because you said that, you know, her story kind of ended with the last major work of the EU. So, like, sh- she was going to destroy the universe and she destroyed the EU, kind of. It's just 
she ended it well, all. Well, there was then. still there was story <laughs> after that, but it was like, I mean, they had another. They had to fight Darth Crate. That was the whole thing. But like, I'm not. I'm saying like the, the EU no longer <laughs> exists because she destroyed the universe. Okay. So that's why it doesn't right. exist anymore. Jeremiah, people are in the <laughs> chat are saying Jeremiah is the biggest threat to the EU galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> And you guys, it's Jeremit. I don't know why everyone's forgetting that. But. No, it's Jeremiah. That's my name. Yeah. Jeremit. Yep. All right. So, do, so are we gonna it, do we fly over to the voicemails? Is this what we're doing now? Or do we ride tauntauns? Why? Or what? Why so, would we ride tauntauns? Because why not? I'd have to completely make. Like a, a completely new thing with like a tauntaun going in the background. That's true. For that. So well, I guess we're no, already we'll... flying, so then we just get our our call in, our intercom. Yep. I was just going to play the voicemail transition okay. so we can talk about That's what I mean. Quick. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I'm going to do that right now. All right. Hear that? It's the sound of voicemail time. So, like I said, we're going to start doing this towards the end now. Uh, and we have six, seven voicemails to go through. Uh, and I am really excited because we've got two from Tanner, two from Trey, and we've got a special one from David. Who's David? <laughs> you don't know who David is? I think I know who David is. Others don't know who David is. Yeah. Right. The final anyway. voicemail from Dune, guys. R.I.P. Yeah, okay. All right, so we're going to start with a voicemail from Rogue. You ready? Yep. <laughs> Drew, it sounded like you weren't ready for a second. Sorry. All right, let's go. Hello, Empire Radio. I have a quick challenge for you guys. Can you do a Yoda impression, but with a Sith Lord quote? This should be really interesting. Thank you for making an amazing podcast. Bye. Thank you, Rogue. So I have never once been able to do Yoda. Me either. I know Jeremiah can. Drew said he was going to do it for us. What? No, I am not. (laughs) I'm trying to think of a Sith quote. You just got to say, it do. No, don't. No, don't do that. Do, uh, let's see. Twice the pride, double the fall. I can't. I can't do that kind of voice. I. I'm. I can't either. No, I cannot. My voice is too high. So it looks like it's you, Andrew. Andrew, you got I this. Literally just said I. D- I can't do this one. <laughs> I, I can't, can't either. either. It's that and Wookies are the two that I, I, can, like, I can't make work. <laughs> That's my Wookie. <laughs> that that was my Wookie right there. <laughs> hey, this is Rogue, right? This is Rogue sent that in. Yes. I don't know, Rogue. You might have. Stumped us. <laughs> Stumped us. I don't know. I can't. I... Just say it backwards. Well, yeah, but I you gotta do it in the voice. Like I can do like the Yoda. Like, mm, I can do that. I, I feel that's like Jeremiah can, can do it. I feel like Jeremiah secretly can nope. do it. I can. Go, mm, that's all I can do. That's that's Yoda. Mm. He said, mm. Mm. See, like, "That's it. That's it." <laughs> okay. That's that's Palpatine pondering something. That's my Sith quote. Mm. There you go. Next, next voice. <laughs> you know what, Rogue? Just for you, I'm oh. gonna practice. Ooh. And I'll give you one. Let me practice. All right. All right. I promise. You have my word. I was hoping okay. one of them was gonna be able to do it, but you no, know what? Sorry. I'll. Uh, sorry, we let yeah. you down. You had those nice words for us, but. <laughs> <sighs> Andrew, right. stepping up. We're going to move on to Tanner voicemail one of two. Here we go. Hello, you beautiful people. Uh, Tanner here. Um, so my question is, have any of you been brought to tears at any point in viewing the Star Wars saga, um, TV shows, movies, any of that included, like any, any Star Wars material? Um, have you been brought to tears by it? I was talking with a friend about it the other day, and it didn't happen to me when I was younger, and it happened to my mom when we went to see episode three in theaters when Anakin's like, I hate you, to Obi-Wan. She started crying. I'm like, Mom, that's so lame. Why are you crying right now? This is super, this is crazy cool. 
but like as i got older i understood like the bond that anakin and obi-wan had and it i don't know it brings me if not close to tears it brings me to tears um but yeah that's my question uh you guys are killing it keep up the good work and yeah see you later dude tanner what the heck that was a good that, that was, was a good, good one tanner that was a straight good one yeah what the heck okay so really quickly i have never been brought to tears weird flex but okay <clears throat> but if there is a scene that ever has brought me close it is that scene what's like scene? that's always that's the the scene oh. between anakin and <clears throat> anakin and obi-wan like that's the one that always like it it, I, it actually takes a lot to make me cry so once again weird flags yeah, i know i knew that was coming <laughs> but i will say that that one and then i actually just looked down and twist said the death of chirut was close Chirrut, yeah uh that one was also i forgot about that but that one was also like that that hit pretty yeah. hard for me too uh so those i mean there are definitely moments where like my heart sinks when i'm watching star wars and i'm like oh frick that would that would really suck that would be terrible to go through and like my heart breaks a little bit, but I've never cried. So, so for me, I get, it doesn't matter if it's star Wars or whatever, but I get really emotionally attached to like stories and shows and characters and stuff. And so like, like I get, I get like, like I don't like sob cry, but like sometimes I get teary eyed when I watch certain things. And so the only two in star Wars, I can think of. Um, right, I I'm sure there's been other ones that I just can't think of, but they're actually both from Rebels, and the first one. Oh was... no, I forgot about that. What? One of the ones that you're gonna say. <laughs> I, I have a feeling there's another one that I forgot. I have I one like... from Rebels too. It has nothing too. to do with Ahsoka. I'll tell you that. It, no, oh. mine doesn't either. There, okay. there is another one that I actually think I did tear up a little bit. I just remembered, but so... you're gonna say it. Go. So, I think a little over a year ago, I rewatched Rebels just on my own. I kind of just binged it over the course of like a couple of weeks, three weeks, or something. A couple of hours, you said. Yeah, a couple. Yep. You just did minutes. it in one sitting. Yep. Like, and so, and it's it's a this is what I'm saying is it's a weird one because I didn't expect it to happen because it's such like a small scene, but I think it's like three or four episodes into season one, and it's where Callus finds you know our rebel squad our squad of a group or whatever and callus steps out with his the the lasat bow rifle and when um what's his face the lasat zeb zeb he he like says he st- ends up and like only a Lasat, uh, honor, honor guard, honor guard, whatever. Yeah. And then Callus steps out and says, "Lasat, fight me!" And then when they start fighting, I got like teary eyed when they happened because like mm-hmm. this is like after the fact where I know their story together, like their story arc. Oh, and how yeah. Zeb turns Callus back and how whatever, like so that like was super. Like, I was surprised that that happened, um, but the other one that gets me a lot in Rebels is when Sabine is is practicing dueling with Kanan and she has her breakdown where she reveals all of her inner struggles and puts it out in the open and how she blames herself for the fall of Mandalore to the Empire. Mm-hmm. And every time that just gets me because the music is intense, her story is going, it's just, I don't know, I always get emotional with that. Yeah. I thought you were going to say Kanan's death. Oh, and yeah. that one, that, that was the one's... one I totally forgot. That was the one I'm like 99% sure I teared up for that one. That, yeah, and maybe I did too. Yeah, someone just mentioned it in the chat. Uh, David actually, Hera feeling Kanan's hand after he was gone, like that whole progression, yeah, of him dying in the, the immediate aftermath, like that. That, that whole me. fourth season is like tear dude, dude, and the whole time. Mm-hmm. That's why <laughs> Rebels is better in my perspective than clone wars that's fair but we're, that's not what the episode's about true um the canon thing was rough for me though uh the soka with seeing 
Vader slash Anakin again. Oh, yeah. That was a pretty intense moment for me. I was like, oh, wow. Like, little Annie's in there still. So that was pretty intense. Um, leaving the movie theater and after episode seven was pretty emotional. Because... It's so bad. No. That was eight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, it was it was just like... Going opening night and being in that room with a bunch of people, oh yeah, that's been sure. waiting literally their whole like so much of their life to get this episode, like this movie, yeah. and to get it, it was pretty emotional. Yeah, like just to be there, like watching it now, it doesn't give me emotional at all. But just I know when I was there, it was very emotional. Yeah. And then uh, any other Star Wars medium, um, when I went to Galaxy's Edge for the first time, I cried. Oh, okay. What? It's true. I I cried. Big it was pretty flags. intense. Big well, she, weird flags. Okay, I'm right. not. I'm just saying. All right, but yeah, no, that's good. Tanner, A that plus. Good question. A that plus. Good question. And here's the thing: we've got a second one from Tanner. So Ooh. if the second one is as good as the first one, holy crap! If Jeremiah good, might cry. If it's not that as story good, arc, I'm judge you. That story arc. Okay, go. All right, you ready? Yeah. What is up, boys? It's Tanner. Um, back again with another question. I don't know if this one has been asked, but I was talking with a a friend who loves Star Wars. We've loved Star Wars together, and we've bonded over Star Wars for like 16 or 17 years now. Oh, that's oh wow. That's cute. I was talking with him. We were talking about where we would like to live in the Star Wars universe. Any planet, anywhere you would like. I personally, cliche, but I would pick Coruscant <laughs> because I love big cities. I've always been drawn to them. I think they're so cool. I grew up in East Jesus Nowhere, Wisconsin, where there's just <laughs> corn, cows, and fields. So, yeah, cities have always been intriguing to me, and I always see, like, in the movies, Coruscant looks like a banger of a place to hang out and be and live. <clears throat> and living in Minneapolis, I know I would love living in there. So, so, yeah, that's my question. You guys keep up keep keep up that awesome work, boys. Thanks. That oh. accent. Oh, Did he say you. East Jesus, Wisconsin? Yeah. <laughs> that what he said? Oh, thanks, Derry. Appreciate ya. See, if you can do that, actually, yeah, you can do Yeah, come on. Yoda. You're not come even on. from the Midwest. Yeah. I literally oh. said I was going to practice. And oh, do yes. that's true. That's true. Okay. That's true. Don't, don't, don't pick on me. Don't pick on me. I think you me. got it in there. Don't pick on it's me in there. <laughs> if you're not going to do the same. <laughs> like, I feel Ooh, like it's going to be uh -huh. so good. No. You're going to be hired to do Yoda's voice in, like, that Star Wars. That's not... Hashtag give it to Andrew. That's not okay. That's not a thing. You wouldn't do that if they offered you that and you did a good impression that you not could. For, not for you, dude. You know how challenging being a voice actor is and doing it well. I could, I'm saying if they pressure, offered you the job, pressure. that means you could do it well. Maybe you wouldn't take the job. I would take the job. Yeah, okay. you would. But anyways, <laughs> so what was the question again? Where would you live? <laughs> oh. People in the uh, chat spamming Andrew I, or I Drew like pick Tatooine. This, but I feel like we did answer this in the AUA thing, but. I think we determined for me that it would be like Naboo. Naboo. Because like Boo. I'm a uh, I'm a city person, <laughs> but like you will need. But Coruscant is too much, too big, and like I need good Wi-Fi, and Tatooine's not gonna do it for me. So, like, I think I feel like Naboo has good Wi-Fi, has good scenery. Banger yeah, I I, life. I think we did answer this because I pick uh. Naboo as well because it has the city life but then there's also like places to go fishing like you can get some outdoorsy stuff too but then there also is a city life um Tatooine would be fun just going to the cantina once in a while but I don't think I could live on Tatooine because sand gets everywhere so yep that's true yeah it does yes it does um I think Naboo would be really cool um, Endor? Sheila? What? No. No, not after the Ewoks. I mean, stuff. they have multiple... They have a castle there. You can they have so many castle. cool um, stuff. They also have a they have giant They have bears monster. that attack you. and Yeah, I don't want to deal with that. Plus, the, I feel like the mosquitoes on Indoor are like Ooh. the size of a car. <laughs> It's true. Yeah. It, it, it's, like, it's like going to like the swamp anywhere. Like, you, yeah. I... Yeah. I I Chila would be kind of cool, even though it's super, super cold. 
to live underground in the Chiss cities. That would be pretty fun. Um, I get super pale, though, so maybe not. <laughs> I'm still trying to regain my tan after seven years of living in Minnesota. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, Probably Naboo. Naboo would be like, really cool. Naboo is like a, all three of us. So oh, yeah, I guess we're hanging out and doing I, I a podcast do on Naboo, guys. I, I could do Coruscant, but I feel like it's way, it's way. I would get so pissed off in traffic. Oh, I would kill yeah. someone. Yeah, literally, or buy death sticks. I'd really love to. <laughs> Drew, what the heck? <laughs> you need to rethink your life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's why I'm going to stay in Naboo. <laughs> I people are just in the chat are saying Scarif, and uh, Scarif would be really cool as well because it's just beaches. Yeah, but like not when the Empire was there, because that would be a, that, that would be a pretty big killjoy. Tanner did say, "What are you talking about? There's no traffic, because they're f- that's even worse. Because they're imagine? flying. I can't Tanner, navigate through that. Tanner, you have to have the force to navigate that. Tanner and Daddy Palps and Drew and Jeremiah, you all will get this reference. Imagine rush hour, thirty five W or ninety four. I, I, I can't get this. Sorry. Oh, that's right." <laughs> okay, so the three of you then imagine 35W or 94 rush hour. It's not as bad but you're as... flying. You're in yeah. a hover car, stopping and going in a hover car, thousands of feet above the planet. No, thank you. Nope. No, and there's geese you. passing by. Uh, uh-uh, no. Mm-mm, mm-mm. That's like worse than running into deer. Nope. Yeah. So, all right. Now. We're moving on to Trey. We have two voicemails from Trey. Here is the first one. Hey, what's up, guys? My name's Trey. Big fan of the podcast. Thanks, Trey. And I'm a huge Emperor Palpatine fan. Ah. Ever oh. since I was a kid, I've been obsessed with him. Interesting. I was 10 years old when Revenge of the Sith came out, but I never ended up getting to see it in theaters. Oh, oh GG. Um, so when Rise of Skywalker came out, it was a big deal to me because I never thought I'd be able to see Ian play the emperor in theaters ever yeah oh that's cool uh personally i love that movie even though i feel most of the fandom does not so i was wondering for you guys is there any part of any of the star wars movies that you love that you feel like most of the fandom does not thanks guys oh that's a good question tatooine Um, (laughs) he said most of the fandom not jeremiah oh that's okay there's a difference um I think I really like Broom Kid. Do you say the movies or Star Wars in general? Just Star Wars in general. Star Wars in general. Okay. But, but it has to be something that the general fandom doesn't like. Right. I, I do a lot of hating on The Last Jedi. A lot of hating. And I do not think... I do Watch not think what you're about to say. I don't think it's a good like overall part of the Skywalker saga. I don't. But in a vacuum, as its own movie... I think I enjoy it visually. Like, the story's all over. Okay, like, the whole Kanto <laughs> bite thing, of course. Like, it doesn't make any sense. But, like, I, I do enjoy that movie a lot visually. Yeah. Uh, and I find it very entertaining to watch as by itself. Because it has, to me, some of the most beautiful shots at that point so far in a Star Wars, piece of Star Wars media. Like, for cinema. Like, the dude, the, the freaking Holdo maneuver shot is still one of my favorite scenes in star wars because of the execution of it the way that they like completely cut out the sound the cinematography which really isn't cinematography it's more vfx stuff but like still i i really enjoy the last jedi for what it is if i get past the story and its contributions to the skywalker (laughs) (laughs) but like i think i would watch the last jedi before I'd watch The Force Awakens. Ooh. How dare you? Sorry. See, he asked he asked our opinion. Yeah, see the That's thing is fair. I I will always defend the good stuff about The Last Jedi. Like I, I will That's always why you never that. say anything. That makes sense. Nice job. No, I I don't hate on it as much as Drew just absolutely hates it. I, with, I, I I've tried. There's nothing I've, in that movie that he likes. Nope. Like there's not not. He well, doesn't like Leia the maneuver. He doesn't like Leia the cinematography. F- he doesn't no, like I, the music. I can't. No, 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 no. I just no. don't get it. Well, the music, no, I do. 
The music, of but, course. So for me to answer the question, I, I will defend the Last Jedi for the good stuff in it. Um, as far as other things in Star Wars that I think are great, like that others don't, I'm not really sure. Because obviously, like I love Ahsoka; she's my favorite. So like everyone, she's a, a fan favorite, and like all these characters are, are fan favorites. Like I'm just trying to think if there's any minor characters that people hate on that I like, but I don't hate Jar Jar as much as everybody. Um, would you say you love Jar Jar? I would not say that. No. Oh. Okay. He's he he's not that bad. No, he's not that bad. No, he's not that bad. I'm trying to think. First of all, the was... lightsaber duel in Snoke's. I uh, don't even get me started on that. That's one of the worst parts of the whole. Someone literally said, "Well, what, the lightsaber is fire." No, it's kind of awful. Um, okay. but actually, though, no, nope. There's no lightsabers touching in that whole thing, so it's not a lightsaber <laughs> duel. Anyways. Um, well, let let Andrew say what he was. Gonna, what were you gonna say? That's fine. Go ahead, no. Drew. I thought you were say, gonna defend say, that. I was. I was gonna defend that scene, but I'm not going to anymore. You say oh. what you want to say. Go oh ahead. dang! Shots fired. Bro. Go ahead, Drew. I'm trying to think. <laughs> I don't even. You were know. gonna say anything, and now you just think I gotta think. <laughs> no, because I got distracted. Oh, it's my fault now. Okay. No, not by you. By the chat. Oh, so now you're blaming the fans. Oh. Okay, oh. you guys. What oh. is going on here? You have done that yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um I don't know. I don't well, Okay. I feel so like Andrew. Oh, okay. I feel like a lot of people don't enjoy the the death of Boba Fett, the original death. But I feel like as a kid, it didn't bother me as much. So. But what about now? Uh, I don't. Well, he's not dead, so I guess it's not. You know what I mean? But the scene still exists. The scene doesn't bother me. Okay. Like, I think. No, I don't think the scene ever bothered me. I just kind of accepted it as a young child. Like, that was his death. So you're you're saying you like that scene. And the general Star Wars population does not. I feel like a lot of people hate on that scene a lot. I think I would agree with Drew on that. A lot of people okay. don't like how he died. Yeah. All right. And I and I I never really had a big issue with it. And now that he's not dead, I definitely have no issue. And like no one really does anymore because he's not dead. But like if he was still well, dead, well, well, maybe people do then. I mean, for the. For one of the best bounty hunters who, in the expanding universe, mm -hmm. mind you, becomes the Mandalore. True. Uh, and could become the Mandalore in this, too. We don't know. It's possible. But, well, it's not as possible, though. Because there's a lot of other really good Mandalorians out there that he would have to compete with. But True. we're not getting into that. That's fair. And he uh, kind of took over Tatooine. But, yeah. yeah. So anyway, Andrew, what were you going to say about the... I was going to say that... It's interesting. I loved that fight scene. Loved it. Hardcore loved it. I walked out of The Last Jedi and remember thinking to myself that that fight scene in the Snoke's Storm Room was one of the best parts of the whole movie. Until I watched the stuntmen react breakdown. Of yeah. That scene. Oh. <laughs> and they were like, they're like, hey, look at all these guys in the background. Because like, you, you're not looking at the background. But yeah, even you're, still, only, you're only looking at Ray and yeah, Kylo the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. But even still. I thought, I think it's really good. I mean, I, of course, it's not a lightsaber duel you, by technicality. You can't call it a lightsaber yeah. duel if they don't touch. But, like, at the end of the day. I, I don't know. I good. can't. After that breakdown, I can't get. See, I haven't I even can't. fully seen that breakdown. It's just when I was watching it in theaters, I was like, we all know what's going to happen at the end of this. We all know that he, he still has to be bad. You know what I mean? Because Snoke's dead. Who's a bad guy now? Like, what are they going to run, hold hands and run off together? Like, no, we all... So, like, it was so predictable that it just took me out of the whole moment. And I just couldn't enjoy the scene. Like, even watching it the first time. Mm. And right. and that could be just the whole writing around it. But, yeah. And then now, going back and rewatching it and breaking it down, it's like... 
it should have died like five times, but you know. All right, yeah. next voicemail. <laughs> All right, number two from Trey. Here we go. Oh, wow. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, it's Trey again. Just uh, wanted to ask one more question for you guys. So like I said in the last one, I'm a huge Emperor Palpatine fan. Mm. So I've built up quite a bit of a collection. So I have um, you know, a couple Ian McDermott signed photos and whatnot. Oh, dang. Uh, the prize of my collection is a um, prosthetic that was worn by Ian McDermott during the shooting of Revenge of the Sith and also signed by Ian McDermott. Uh, so I was wondering for you guys uh, <laughs> what the prize of your collections would be as well as is there anything that at some point you would really love to add to your collection? Thanks, guys. Wow, that is First of all, crazy. that's pretty cool that you have a prosthetic signed by Drew. Ian. Say it. It's it's a banger. No, dude, seriously, of all the times, weird flex. You're not oh, gonna say weird flex. No, because I well, That's a cool yeah. flex. That's a weird... You're not gonna say anything related to flex? No, I was in awe. Uh, I mean a he, shock. He was, so, he was so shocked that he couldn't his And if you're flex. in the Discord, please send us a picture of that so I can see it. Yeah, Drew wants to see it. Cause that sounds amazing. And also, have you met him in person? That's my question to you, sir. Yeah, I hear he's really nice. Well, I would assume he has met him because he has lots of things signed by him, right? Well, you can buy things. That well, true, signed. true, true. That that's fair. But I'm just yeah. saying. But yeah, that's true. All right, Drew. Let's uh let's let you start since you have the entire Star Wars memorabilia collection from like the last five years behind you. Uh, okay. So, what's your uh, most prized what's what's your most prized piece, and what would you want to add to it? Go uh, right now. If money were no object. If money were no object. Go. My most prized piece is I have Marvel Episode One, A New Hope, the first Marvel comic book series. I have the first book. And it's signed by the original artist that I got signed. And so that's probably my m most prized possession slash thing that's probably worth the most amount of money um, in my collection. And then something that I really want. I don't. Nothing that like I I'm those collectors. I don't have anything in mind that I don't think I could get like right now. Does that make any sense? So that means your bank account is constantly in danger. Yes, but yeah, but, if, but, but if, if money were no object, I, I, what is one? Yeah, thing I'm you trying. Want? I'm trying to think that I don't. I honestly don't know. Something that's always intrigued me. I would say that potentially would be really cool to have would be any props from. New Hope to Jedi, like any of those props, like maybe like the original like Boba Fett helmet, something like that, anything like that. Yeah. Um, I would also love to have a full life size like trooper outfit, like any clone, like that'd be so cool. I would, I would pay really good money to see you in one of those. Thank you. I would love to wear one of those. Yeah. Chat make it happen, um. But oh, wow. okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not doing that. <laughs> but thanks for the follow. Hey, but I think the biggest thing for me, I would love to have the original Boba Fett figure, three and three quarter inch that shoots. Oh, with the with the jetpack, she yeah. rocket. I would love that. So, so you're going, you're going. I'm going. Skinny. I'm going Dang. twenty thousand dollars deep yeah dude there are some of those that have but sold there's for hundreds yeah hundreds of thousands yeah there is crazy. but i would love to have one of those or yeah. honestly now that i really think about it the entire original set of three and three quarter inch figures i would love to have that at one point okay that's legit sick dude jeremiah the least materialistic out of all three of us yes what, um, do, what do you have to say i would want Dave Filoni's original concept Star Wars underwear. Ew. His original concept drawings for Ahsoka Ooh. signed Ooh, by him. Oh, that would be Ooh. amazing. 
Sick. You would cry if he gave you that, huh? Yeah. So if I could have that like signed by him, and then I would be pretty cool. So that would be my choice. So, do you have anything right now that's like the prize piece of your collection? I have. Well, I, the only Star Wars stuff that I own would be, I got the Soka Pop from season seven. Yeah, that's what Drew got me for Christmas. You're yeah. welcome. You're welcome. Um, but. I know you guys know, but I don't think anyone, any of our fans know this, but I have all but two of the, from the Phantom Menace, like the Pepsi cans and Mountain yeah, Dew cans. Do. I have those all except for two. They're, yeah, they're empty. Do. I wish they still had the liquid in them, but I have almost a complete set of that boxed up in storage. Sick. And I don't, and I have my Star, my Mandalorian flag. That's like the only Star Wars stuff I have. <laughs> That's pretty That's, cool, though. Everyone knows you have it. Yeah. yeah. At least everyone that saw the video. Or right. anyone that goes to his apartment building. Yep. yep. So my computer is freaking out right now. Like the mouse is like moving by itself. Oh, oh. that's cool. That's okay. It's and, just Avaloth. So I feel like someone's like hacking into my computer right now, but I don't really know. It's just Avaloth. So if it accidentally clicks the X button, this this might be what happens. <laughs> okay. So. We'll just we'll remember you in, in the Force Spirit. You'll be okay. Uh, for me, I have a very small, very small collection. I'm like the the midway point between Jeremiah, who does like doesn't want to spend money on any of it, and then Drew. Uh, <laughs> that's like his thing, and so I have like a mediocre kind of collection. Uh, so, but I would say my my most prized possession of that is one of two things. So last week, this is going to sound really funny. Last week, I accidentally found that I had issue number two <clears throat> of the Dark Horse Dark Empire comic series. <laughs> Ooh. I didn't know I had it. And it's like, it's old and beat up. And I don't know how old it, I haven't looked at the date yet, but like I was going through my books and there's like a little section where I have all the comics that I have together. And I was like, what is this? And I pulled it out and it's like, since when do I have issue number two of Dark Empire? Like that doesn't make any sense. I don't remember ever obtaining this. And my wife was like, uh, yeah, you remember you found it randomly. It was like somebody was giving it, it was like in an apartment building or something. And it was in a pile of things giving, people were giving away. And I pulled it, and at the time, I don't think I realized what I had. Mm. But like now, knowing that it's it's like the one the whole where Palpatine comes back and Luke goes to the dark side and everything, like that was super cool. So that's that's one of them. The other one is, and I think I mentioned this before. I have the vinyl. I was at I have price books, and I got the Star Wars: A New Hope vinyl, and it was like. It's pretty old and beat up, and it's it was like it was only twenty five bucks. It was crazy, and I bought it, and I pulled it out, and it has a pristine condition poster in it that has some Ralph McQuarrie artwork of the trench run with a Y wing, and it's this whole thing. It's got like an an old like almost yellow order form in it for like Star Wars merch and stuff, and like a book that goes through a New Hope and details the characters and stuff. And I was like, oh, this is super cool, but whatever. And then I remember, like, months later, reading an article in StarWars.com where a guy, it was, like, the, like, 10 rare items or something like that. And he described this record that was only printed a certain number of years and had all of the things in it that mine had. And it was from, like, 1978 or 79. Dang. And I was like, what? And I went back, and I had all of it. So, like, I have... Like, it's not in great con – the outside cover isn't in great condition, but, like, I have an original, like, 70s pressing of a New Hope soundtrack on vinyl, and I've got the poster with it. That's so pretty cool. That's pretty cool, yeah. Um, but then if I could have anything, if money wasn't an option, I would for sure – I want an original uh, Return of the Jedi Luke lightsaber hilt prop. I want that. And I would want, basically, it would just be a bunch of lightsaber props. 
<laughs> That's fair. Like that, like that would be what I would go for. Like Luke's, I would want Qui Gon's, um, the dark saber prop that they use for the Mandalorian. Like it would be like just a bunch of lightsaber replicas that I could have and say that I have them from the original films and stuff and media. So, yeah. Dude, Fun. thanks, Trey. That was really great. All right, Riley. We got another uh, voicemail from the Gonk himself. Ooh. Here we go. Hey, guys. It's Riley back at it with another dad joke. Uh, what did Han Solo say to the waiter when he recommended the haddock? Never sell me the cods. Ah, ah, ah. Uh, it's painful. <laughs> it's so painful. <laughs> oh, Riley. I got to write that one down. <laughs> Yeah, you do. Actually, you, you, that's, that one's going to come in handy later. That one will. All right. <laughs> Next. <Okay>. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, we really appreciate that, Riley. Yeah, that was tough. And last but surely not least, you know him, you love him, Dune. R.I.P. Hello, gentlemen. I am Dune, and I am ready. A special request from Andrew. I was asked to sing a song, and this oh. is my performance. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Wait, that was it? Yeah. He, he told me ahead sing? of time. He told me not to let you guys hear it beforehand, and I didn't. But he didn't actually sing? I was getting really ready for the singing. That was the whole point. <laughs> oh. He rickrolled Andrew. He, he rickrolled everyone. So, well, there we go. That was R.I.P. Dune. So uh, this is a good segue. Thank you, everyone, who sent in voicemails for your awesome questions. Yes. Um, we would love to hear from you. If you haven't sent one in, if you've got a question, or if you sent one in and you have another question, uh, feel free to go to the link. There's a link below your podcast uh, listening service, whichever one you pick, Spotify, Apple, Google, whatever. Uh, where you can click that and you can leave a voicemail. Also, uh, there are links uh, on our Twitch and uh, on our Instagram bio as well where you can go and you can click it. It opens up more links. It's like a it's like linkception. And on top of all of our social medias being there, there's a link directly to leave us a voicemail there as well. So go ahead. Feel free to leave it for us. Uh, every Tuesday, we're going to do this every Tuesday. Um at the end of every episode so if you've got one send it and the offer still stands if we hit 12 or more we hit 12 or more we will completely well we're not going to scrap it but we'll, we'll shelf the idea for a tuesday episode and we will do an entire voicemail episode but here are the two conditions one no less than 12 if you get 11 it's not going to work you have to have 12, 12 or more and two they have to be like legitimate questions. So, so now we can't have 12 dad jokes. Yeah, we can't have like, 12 dad jokes. Well, <laughs> that was I, love, I love dad jokes. But if we have 12 dad jokes, that's going to be a five minute episode, maybe 10 minutes, and then we're going to be done. So make sure they're legitimate questions. Um, if you want to get a group of you and 11 friends, Get your questions together and ask them. Whatever you want to do, but the two re the requirements are you have to have twelve, at the least, and they have to be sub actual substantial voicemails, like Tanner's or Trey's or Rogues, assuming we can do the impression. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, but also, we are on the internet via the social medias, so yep. you can find us on Instagram and Facebook, both of which are at Empire Radio Podcast. We're on YouTube at Empire Radio, a Star Wars podcast. We are on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Empire Radio, where we stream every recording uh, of all of these episodes and all the episodes that we do on The Bad Batch on Fridays, both nights, Tuesdays and Fridays, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, normally it's like 8, 9, 07, or like... 10 minutes after we're pretty we're getting pretty consistently unless like it's me and jeremiah only Shut then we're on time actually we're mouth. early we're like a minute early and it's only an hour episode but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> well anyways so 8 p.m 
Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you can go to twitch.tv forward slash Empire Radio to catch those streams. If you haven't already and you're a part of Twitch and you watch the streams, please follow. Please give us a follow. We would very much appreciate it. Um, and last but surely not least, you can join our Discord. We have a Discord uh, entirely dedicated to the podcast and everything Star Wars. It is a party. Uh, and if you want to join that, you have to have a link. To, there's an invitation link. So there are a few ways to do that. One, you go to, uh, we have a pinned Facebook post that has the link in it. Or you can go to the link, the same link that I mentioned earlier that had the link for the voicemail. That link section link also has the link in it to join the Discord. And Twitch. Yep. There's a link on Twitch page as well. So Yeah. Um, but before we forget to mention it, Andrew, welcome yeah. back. Oh, thanks. Welcome back. Appreciate it. We missed you the last episode. Thanks. And welcome back. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I come, I leave for one week and then they let me do, e, you know, EU stuff. It's a, we we, we had to figure week. out how to get them to come back. So oh, like, wow. Oh, we, we don't want to lose Andrew, so... Well, yeah. speaking of things being gone, oh, uh, we do have some unfor <laughs> unfortunate news that uh, our merch website that we have been talking about for the past few weeks, it got taken down. And it got taken down because of copyright issues. Uh, basically, it was flagged automatically. and they It was up it for not even a month. It wasn't even up for a month. Nope. Uh, they took it down. They didn't even tell us they took it down. We just got word that the link kept messing up and... We emailed them, and they were like, yep, it was copyright-related. Your stuff was too close to Star Wars. Um, I'm not sure how we're supposed to do that, being a Star Wars podcast, but we're going to figure it out, and uh, we're going to try to get all of the merch options that we previously had up and running again for everyone. So stay tuned. We're going to be working on that over the next few weeks, um, and hopefully we'll have some news on that to roll out shortly. Yes. Uh, we have to figure out a way to find a way to, to, to produce the actual merch. Uh, do so without one of us having a stack of t-shirts in our living room at all times and uh, also without getting sued by the the mouse himself because we would lose that pretty quickly <laughs> yep so and we would have been it, like it was fun boys <laughs> it was fun <laughs> and we can do it from jail if we all end up in the same jail you know during our lunch breaks we can just do quick episodes um so yeah uh, no more merch for the time being. Uh, if you've got merch, you could turn around and flip that merch for <laughs> easily like five hundred to a thousand dollars because it's rare now. Uh, go on eBay, do your thing. Uh, if anybody buys it, let us know because we will be just as surprised as you are. <laughs> uh, but anyways, but honestly, uh, so yeah. it's gonna be like in you know like you know forty years from now when they're doing people are doing a podcast about us and they do a voicemail like what. What piece of memorabilia from Empire Radio would you like to have? It's going to be the mug that someone bought like on the first run, and it's like the only mug in existence or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Daddy Palps in the Twitch chat right now, I look down. He's got one of the only shirts. Yep. And then yep. someone has a does have a mug, too. Someone does. I really wanted a mug, and I never got one, Well, so fine. we'll figure it out. Don't, yeah, we'll, we'll merch is out. not we'll going know. to go away. So if you guys were going to go purchase and you guys weren't able to at the time, we will save, figure it save out. Save your money. Save it up. Put that money aside. Put in a separate bank account that says ER on it. And get, get, get your uh, uh, high interest account. So yeah, even, so put more in it constantly. <laughs> even better, get your Phantom Menace banks Ooh. of Qui-Gon, Darth Maul, and Obi-Wan. That had the buttons that you pushed them, and if you linked them all together, it recreated a little lightsaber battle scene from the Phantom Menace. And put your coins in there. That's a deep cut. I uh, anybody? No idea what that if, is. That's pretty if deep. Do you know about this Banks? Because I had Qui Gon, and I'm pretty sure I had Obi Wan. I don't ever think I had Maul, but if you know about those Banks, let us know on social media in the Discord. Let leave us a voicemail because I had those. I never put any money in them because I was young and I didn't have a job. But they were really cool because they acted out that lightsaber duel. So That's pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, that's it, boys. This is the first unofficial episode of the unofficial series EU with Andrew, where we talked about Abeloth. Uh It was a fun one. 
and I'm going to begin preparing my next episode. Uh-oh. All righty. I don't know when that's going to be, but it's going to be another banger. So anything else? Nope. Nope. All right. Well, you have been listening to another fantastic episode of the Empire Radio Podcast. I'm Andrew. I'm Jeremiah. I'm Drew. And may the force be with you. Oh.